Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, and tonight I am joined once again by my good friend, uh, writer and director and film historian, Mr. C. Courtney Joyner, best known for his work on the Shotgun series and the writing and directing for Full Moon, such as Trancers 3 and The Lurking Fear. How are you tonight, Mr. Joyner? How are you, my friend? Oh, uh, Tom, this is terrific. This is a favorite subject, so this is this is really neat. I'm truly looking forward to this. This is a this is a great topic tonight. We're going to be discussing movie serials from a bygone era, which basically started at the dawn of cinema in the 19 teens. Is that Courtney? Like I don't. I, I went. I tried digging back. Movie serials started in the 1911, 12 thereabouts really at the dawn of motion pictures and ended in 1956 and god the everyone ate them up from the roaring 20s to the depression era to the wartime to the baby boomers everyone loved movie serials well you know when we talk those very first uh those origin points there are always a couple of things putting into historical context first of all people were very used to like serialized fiction and newspapers and things like that, because that's how a lot of novels were published at that time. And there was always the feeling, uh, it, although Birth of a Nation and, and you know when features really started, that it kind of allied those fears, but there was always a feeling that people would not sit still for feature-length entertainment. And if you had a dramatic story to tell and it wasn't going to be a two-reeler, so that kind of was one of the reasons that serials were even born is because it was everything in like 10 minute installments. But the funny thing about serials to put it into this context today, now here in 2023, that format never died in a sense no. because where movie serials ended in 56 with, um, Oh, I wrote it down blazing on the overhead trail or so, or, or whatnot. That just became network television, which is still prominent here in 2023. Oh, absolutely. That serialized and, format. Well, and, you know, the serials, of course, themselves taking uh, from radio and what have you and you yeah. know, playing off all, all of those things, particularly the real explosion. I mean, during the silent era, when you've got, of course, the great serial queen of all time, Pearl White. Yep. Pearl, uh, Pearl White. The, God, the oh, queen. She was, incredible and doing her own stunts and all of that stuff and uh, you know she was fearless and uh became so hugely popular but then that was also okay let's introduce cowboy heroes like tom mix and people like that and so you know uh and anything that was popular say in the pulp magazines if it was rin tin tin whatever it might be boom cereals and serials weren't just designed for kids. That was the, I think that's kind of a misconception people might have is that this was just stuff for the kitty matinees. Now, it probably veered towards that as just wasn't, uh, that just wasn't the case. It probably veered that way towards more the, the not the golden age, because the golden age was like what, the, the 20s to like 1945 ish, 6 ish. And then sort of the same cat era. era. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that. But I think also as whether it was Republic or Columbia, as they uh, focused on characters from comic books and things like that, that was because this was going to be for a younger audience or what they saw as the, you know, audience for comic books and pulp magazines and things. And uh, that's the way it went. But radio and all, I mean, you know, everything was fair game. Some of the most famous radio characters then took that transition to the screen. It's the yeah. Lone Ranger yeah. with, uh, oh, who played the Lone Ranger in the serial? Bob uh, Livingston? Bob Robert Livingston? Livingston. Yeah. Robert Livingston and, uh, you know, the Green Hornet with Gordon Jones and Warren Hall. I mean, the radios, the radio then went to serial, then television. And, then and, then television. and of course, ironically, during the serial period, uh, although he played a hero in later some Columbia serials, like uh, I think uh, Sir Galahad, Clayton Moore yep. was very often a bad guy. 
in serials. He was a bad guy. It really wasn't until Zorro, I believe, where Clayton Moore right. was cast. And to bring it into the Lone Ranger connection, John Hart was a henchman too. <laughs> Absolutely, he was. And uh, oh, here, cool. here's some, I've been like waiting for this opportunity to 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 show you something here. This is this is great. Okay, when Universal, this is 1940. Did 1940. The, quote unquote super serial Riders of Death Valley with Dick Ferran and Lon Chaney and Noah Beery and Leo Carrillo and Charlie Bickford and everybody. And it just shows you how popular serials were. They also put out ashtrays for projectionists oh, yeah. to have in their projection room. Yeah, while they're running the serial. And here is one of them. Let me... Riders of Death Valley, the ashtray. There it is. Isn't that In... incredible? That's incredible. And, of course, what we love is the fact it was for the projectionist who's there surrounded by nitrate film smoking a cigarette. <laughs> what was your first exposure to movie serials, Courtney, though? Well, you know... Um, real first exposure was probably through, uh, I would say, it's probably through Famous Monsters of Filmland. Um, I was a little too young for Screen Thrills Illustrated. Yep. Which, which the focus of that magazine, actually I have some copies right there, uh, of the magazine very often was the serials. So uh, I would catch up with things on, really through books, like Alan Barbour. Uh, in fact, I've got one of them right here. Yeah, uh, you know, Days of Thrills and Adventure and all of those books. Here's his uh, cliffhangers. And he wrote so much about serials uh, so that I was reading about them long before I ever saw one because they just weren't available. You didn't Home video, as you always said, they never expected their the life beyond those pictures. They any. expected it for that one right. viewing that Saturday. Right. I ordered through the back uh, through the back of Famous Monsters. Uh, I, I was really curious, and so I saved my you know my pennies. And here is one of the eight millimeter Batman's. Oh, <laughs> I gotta go solo on that one, Courtney. Oh, yeah. I have seen pictures of that. Chapter three: The Living Corpse. The Living Corpse, of course. You know you want that title, and uh, I always love this box. Doctors, the mysterious Doctor Satan. Yep. So there you go. Yeah, and Batman, of course, was Columbia. This was Ken Films. And yep. my friend Steve Latshaw, he has the really rare version of that because they also put it out in a silent edition, but on four on a 400-foot reel. So it's this big box. It's like an album. So it's right. I have a couple of those, but that was really unusual that uh, they would go that distance for an old Republic serial. But I think one of the reasons was these things weren't going out. I, I think the first, if you will, serial, draw, you know, drawn from serial thing I probably ever saw was uh, Satan's Satellites. It was on a uh, TV station when we lived in Philadelphia, and I'd never seen Commando Cody. I not was unaware. I mean, I, I knew that suit because yeah. I had seen pictures of it, but I hadn't seen any of the serials at all. And this was during the period where uh, Republic was re-editing the serials into features. Remember, yes, like they for television, called, like, television format. Or, exactly. They did one yeah. like uh, called The Invisible Monster that I think was uh, edited from one of the G-Men. Or no, Monster in, the, Monster in the Ape became like a TV film, things exactly. like that. Exactly. And so that was how I was slowly, you know, and then I got, I really got interested. And then finally these things went to public domain. Uh, because Bella Lugosi did so many serials. Yes, he did. Phantom Creeps, most notably. And oh, I'd say Phantom would Creeps. You like, I might be wrong would you like to that, see but... some lobby cards? Absolutely. And oh, I brought all these. This one I love uh, because it is it is color. Oh, SOS Coast Guard. Yep, that was William Whitney. Yeah, with Bella. With Bella, and. Uh, I really like this because 
color uh, serial material, and certainly lobby cards, is a little hard to find just because they didn't want to spend the money to print them in color. Although uh, the reissues of the Flash Gordon were uh, done in uh, in color, uh, the, the the lobby materials. Now wait a sec, I I should have organized this a little bit better. Here we go. There's the real McCoy. There's the real McCoy there with Bella Lugosi and the Phantom Creeps, 1939, I think, Corey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, yeah, that's the title card with that famous robot. <laughs> and I just love that. And here is, I think, uh, I had some Shandu stuff. I don't, but now this, thank you, Buddy Barnett. This is really incredible. I'm trying to open this up. It's not in very good shape anymore. But this is an original uh, press sheet from Shadow of Chinatown. Oh, my. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Buddy just gave it to me because it was, you know, kind of torn up. But I was just so thrilled with this. And it just uh, just wonderful. And then, of course, uh, Baylor did the um, the Shandu serial at Mascot. Uh, and, of course, he had been in the, the 20th century, the Fox movie, but had played Roxor the bad guy. Yeah. And so, but then when they did, you know, Shandu and the Magic Island and all that stuff, those were, you know, features derived from the serial. Which it's a shame, kind of it's a shame Bella. It's a, Bella was such a, I mean, he took Hollywood by storm, but like, He's so good in a lot of the things he did, you know, but it just seemed like after Dracula, it went to the serials, then, you know, PRC with the Bowery Boys, and then Ed Gein, uh, um, Ed Wood, Ed Gein, Ed Wood. Well, it was a, it was an odd choice for him to be, now, of course, Boris Karloff was in serials, but he yes, was in he serials pre-Frankenstein. Yes. Uh, King of the Wild, for example. And um, making a serial was certainly considered kind of a demotion or at because least B, B pictures really didn't exist yet. Right. And well, they did, but you know, independent, especially doing one for an independent uh, producer. Now we'd say this about Bella Lugosi doing the serials as cheap as Nat Levine who ran mascot pictures was he paid Lugosi well. And in fact, paid him more than universal paid him. So, you know, that's the, I can understand why, you know, Lugosi, of course, we know, you know, he got so little money for, for Dracula. Yeah. That uh, uh, somebody saying, yes, I, you know, you have value. Why don't you come over and do this? And he was the highest paid person there. So sure. And by the time he would do something like SOS Coast Guard, the horror band was in place and there were a lot of other extenuating circumstances. And so he does. He just comes in and plays a straight bad guy role in that. Uh, in he that was so good at the bad guy. Yeah, just and that that was it. But that uh, you know, uh, Shadow of Chinatown period, and when uh, and every time I said, God, these are weird choices for an actor who has achieved this stardom and this status to kind of fall backwards into serials. But he he did it also because uh, the pay for him was good because they thought it and was he good. And he was not the only Hollywood icon that ever touched movie serials. Obviously, Boris Karloff, Clayton Moore, John Hart, and even a certain Moses Morrison. Uh, yes, indeed. And, yes. Um, you know, when you see... One of the, the, the greats for, for Wayne, and of course, all, almost all of his serials were for Mascot, Hurricane Express, yes. and those movies, uh, is uh, The Three Musketeers, <laughs> where it's now set, you know, in, in the desert, and they're the Foreign Legion and everything. And uh, uh, you see Lon Chaney Jr. and John Wayne. And it's interesting, as many Westerns as Chaney did, um, they were never paired together again. I know. It's, it was one of those, it was just, one of those Hollywood things. But that is a great example of someone who was given a break at a very big level. John Wayne at the big trail and it yep. bombed terribly. So suddenly, you know, okay, we tried this kid out with the big leagues. It didn't happen, but he had a name 
uh, and in the low budget world. And of course, Mascot led to his involvement with Monogram and Republic and even his brief spin at, at Warner Brothers when he was- And the rest is history. Westerns. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, uh, in fact, when you go, and of course, because suddenly then John Wayne becomes a superstar, Nat Levine, they re-edit the series yeah. into features. Now, here, here they that again, just like with Bella Lugosi, not an uncommon practice. And here, Bella Lugosi's co-star in Shadow of Chinatown uh, had his own break in serials. There we got the new adventures of Tarzan. Yep. Let me pull it back a little bit. There you go. Let me go solo for you. Ah, thank you. Chapter 10, Secret Signals. Now, the whole thing here, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs had sold and re I mean, the number of people who wanted to do Tarzan, going all the way back to Elmo Lincoln and the silent era, and they did uh, Tarzan serials back then, uh, they, they were... There were just tons of them, and everything Tarzan touched uh, was gold. He was playing it was absolute gold. So Burroughs decided himself to produce a movie, and that's that's that serial. And Herman Bricks was Burroughs' choice to play Tarzan, not Johnny Weissmuller. Interesting. And so, and Bricks also, you know, was a was a championship swimmer and all that stuff, just like Mr. Crack. And so uh, they go to Guatemala and they made that cereal, which has some remarkable stuff in it. And it, course, especially in those old movie cereals, the stunt work, Courtney, that, that was oh just, God. can't see that today, unless it's no. Tom Cruise, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and, that, and all those guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dave Steele, incredible. And um, uh, of course, now everybody's going, well, as Herman Bricks up to a certain point, and then finally becomes Bruce Bennett, and suddenly he's at Warner Brothers and Treasure of the Sierra Madre and Mildred Pierce. And Great movie. All that stuff, yeah. Uh, my first exposure to Courtney, if I can tell you, was I can remember it clear as day when I first heard of a movie serial. It was 1993, and it was AMC playing Batman and Robin with Robert Laurie as Batman and... Um, Oh, 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 Johnny Duncan as Robin, yep. the where they took on the wizard. That was my first exposure to Batman. As a boy, my only, at that time, Michael Keaton was it. So to, and Adam West to a certain extent. But to see a guy walking around in something that, like, my mother could have made me in my first grade Halloween class, I was, like, enthralled by it. I got enthralled by these serials, and I was like, what is this? And I remember my father and his friend telling me that this is what, they would go to see as kids because my both my parents and my father's friend baby boomers they grew up in the 50s with the matinee picture so i spent like a long time trying to find movie serials on vhs and i had a couple i had a couple but my my favorite was i was at a walmart in 2005 and i came across it's 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 a great serial to me and i know it's not for a lot of reasons and it's it's kind of sort of quote unquote being canceled was the 1943 version of Batman just sitting there on a shelf. And I was I turned it over. I'm like, no way. See how Batman really began. With Lewis Wilson and Douglas Croft and J. Carol Nyash and Shirley Patterson. And I just think that's one of those movie serials that is just obviously a product of its time. But it's still, it's still a well-made Columbia serial directed by Lambert Hillier. Do you mean this one? There it is, chapter 15, The Doom of the Rising Sun. Oh. oh, my goodness, Courtney. God, that is incredible. Rugged, red-blooded He-Man adventure. The Doom That's of the it, Rising baby. Sun. Based on the Batman comics. Oh, it's incredible. Where'd you find that one, Courtney? I, I forget where I picked that up. You know, <laughs> um, Again, Buddy Barnett used to have so much serial material in his shop. And that stuff, what people didn't gravitate towards. A lot of it because it was duotone and things like that. Uh, and so you could pick that stuff up pretty cheaply, uh, even if it was a recognizable character like Batman. And not to in any way minimize people's feelings about, you know, 
uh, the treatment of the Japanese and, and things like that. But, you know, everybody always, you know, they completely, I think, always seem to step over the fact that when these things were going on and these movies were being made, we were at war with Japan. They, they always kind of forget that element. Yes. And, you know, I'm sorry, that war has cultural it, impact. It did. It's, it's, it, I, I'm with you, Courtney. I understand that from a historical aspect that certain things transpired because of the war. And guess what? That's still prevalent today in entertainment. Yeah, look what's it's never it's never going away. That's never no. going to go away. But right. that was but that but for a Columbia serial that was interesting because that was when I first started to realize how the rights of characters worked because I always, you know, still you associate Warner Brothers with Batman and I'm like Columbia. Ooh. And I'm like, Columbia? I'm like, what is this? And then, like, you know, the early days of AOL. Well, and speaking of such Or that time I went to the library. I remember that. The guy looked at me like I had three heads. Ta-da. Do, oh, chapter 15. That's good old Spencer Gordon Bennett could tell. Adam Man versus Superman with Kirk Allen as Superman. You bet. The second, and then obviously he turned down Mole Man. Superman and the Mole. Yeah, Superman and the Mole Men. Yeah. Adam Man versus Superman's all right. But it's funny because this that was going into the 1950s. Obviously, with television starting out, quality and sort of the recognition of movie serials, they almost, I feel like, became C-list pictures. You know, you had motion pictures, A-list, the B movies that, you know, Conway, et cetera, that did Hugh Beaumont, whatever, and other 40 stars. Then you had television. And then we had, well, you know, this is this is also the thing too that you know we the studio identity, like you said, uh, for serials, obviously people immediately think of Republic, and Columbia made serials longer than Republic did, and they were absolutely the last gasp. Herb Yates shut it down. Universal had stopped in 1946. And the studio was sold to J. Arthur Rank and International and all that, or rather they became partners. And they wanted to end that association with B-films and with uh, serials and that stuff completely. So that was the end of that. But it's interesting that, that uh, you know, if people were looking down their noses at Republic Pictures for whatever reason. Uh, Columbia was the studio that was still cranking out serials. And, of course, Paramount and you know, MGM and Warners and those guys, they wouldn't come within a serial for a, a gazillion dollars. Uh, and yet they had very functioning shorts departments, but no series, series movies, but no serials. Sorry, Courtney. I had a little technical snafu on that. I noticed that. I always have my backup ready to roll. <laughs> so, so I noticed that. So I, I, I that's why I propelled forward. If it... Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Courtney. Appreciate that a lot. Uh, where, 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 where were you? What were you discussing at that moment? If you well, don't we mind. were just talking about the studio identity, yeah, with serials and how you know, again, the studio nobody thinks of uh, for being the main serial purveyor, and that was Columbia. It was not Republic. It was Columbia. And yeah, it was, it's weird. And Harry Cohn's attitude towards serials, just like his attitude towards the Three Stooges, just like his attitude towards horror, he hated them. But they were money makers. <laughs> yeah, he never minded the checks. But forget it. You know, Cohn was so image conscious. And he wanted people, when they thought of Columbia, to think about Frank Capra and to think of Cary Grant or Howard Hawks or whatever, not. Lewis yeah. Wilson. <laughs> Not Lewis Wilson, exactly. You know. Not Lewis Wilson. <laughs> and so uh yeah, he he didn't even want to know about it. And yet that studio pervaded more serials for longer than anybody else. Is as a film buff, Courtney, can you confirm or deny a rumor that I've read a couple of times? Hmm. Was J. Carol Nyash supposed to play the Joker? And then that was scoffed at the last second to go into the direction that they went in with J. Carol Nyash as uh, the evil Dr. Tito Daka. Can you, can, do you know anything about that rumor? 
I have heard that. Uh, it would make sense because, of course, the Joker was the preeminent Batman villain. Still is, even though today they glorify him. But yeah. That's a different story. But, um, I mean, I, again, it would make complete and total sense to me that that was... Now, J. Carol Nash se would seem to me like slightly odd casting uh, for the Joker. But you got to remember, too, Batman had only been around for four, four years. So there's no established real backstory. Right. Bob Kane and Bill Finger, because I think Bill Finger was still attached to Batman at this time. Yeah. They were, they were on their toes. Alfred was a fat man. And this, as uh, William Austin portrayed him, that sort of changed the image of Alfred all the way up until the late Michael Goff played him. You know, also, too, uh, this was a character that would have required uh, a much more ex extensive makeup than Dr. Daka. Agreed. And if, the, if, if J. Carol Nash was signed to do this serial, and there's Lou Landers, and, you know, my gosh, you know, the man who directed the Raven and would, Lambert Hillier, would, would, Lambert Hillier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, Lou Landers for Batman. Yep. Uh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. What am I talking? You are right. Uh, that was Lambert Hillier. It was Lambert uh, Hillier. In, yeah. The, the invisible Ray Dracula's daughter. Yeah, so, Dracula's uh, daughter, man. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, we're even, we're even Courtney. <laughs> yeah. We're even for that little snafu. I said, post game pregame. Okay. <laughs> now, now we're all set but uh you know th that's the thing hillier uh i would think about landers of course because he was there at columbia at the same time he was doing the other ones yeah exactly and yeah. Then also then the boogeyman will get you and return of the vampire and all that stuff weird ass movie and <laughs> but, uh Ka J. carol nash i don't know if he could make a demand or if he was on the fence about accepting the part of being because of the makeup. Yeah, and uh, but now Nash, this is the thing about having him play the baddie in the Batman serial. Uh, he floated between A movies and B movies almost effortless. Effortlessly, to his it whole career. Uh, you know, let me do an inner sanctum. Next, I'm doing something for John Ford. Yeah, and I'm coming back, and I'm doing some mystery over at rko then i'll go to columbia i'll do a serial and then i'm going to get nominated for an academy award for a medal for benny i mean he was he was a he was the journeyman of that era absolutely he was absolutely he was and but just to, go ahead a little quick story when we were recording the commentary for um calling dr death great movie great the, job on those that, oh thank you uh and i was with regina laborde uh, Reginald Laborg's daughter and I convinced her to do it. And uh, she's such a nice lady. And in the middle of the recording, she drops that J. Carol Nash is her godfather. That's incredible. I remember you telling me that story when, but yeah. right before the Sanctums came out, and it's just and like, I was like, and I, you can hear me like gulp on the soundtrack, going, "What?" It's like <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And she got, she was like, uh, "Well, yes. I mean, does anybody care?" And I'm like, you know. How is she doing? How is she going crazy? How is she doing? Have you kept in touch with her since that recording? She pops me an email every once in a while, and uh, she's doing just fine. A really, really nice lady. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, I, I like her a lot. But that's, again, you're talking about, you know, how perfect, because uh, I'm surprised Reggie never directed a serial, quite honestly. But there he is. You know, journeyman directors, some of whom had you know, huge credit, some who would go on to other things, but serials were in kind of a weird uh, zone of their own. They were in their own world. It was like their own niche. You had the same sort of henchman. You had the same sort of wardrobe. And, and if you were a filmmaker, let's use William Whitney as, as the great example. I mean, he was so expert at the serials, and of course, he was also directing features at yes. Republic. But Bill Whitney was not getting Sands of Iwo Jima. No. And so they kept him kind of on, on this level. And so many of the other serial filmmakers, whether it's Ray Taylor over at Universal or now one of the exceptions was Ford Beebe, but Ford Beebe becomes a producer first, then comes back and he starts directing and does it very well. Uh, you know, over there at Universal, we think about, say, uh, Night Monster, for example. Love Night Monster. Which we love. 
But for Beeb, then uh, when the serials ended, he goes and makes his deal at Allied Artists to do Bomba the Jungle Boy. And he would switch positions. And the fact that he co-directed, uh, you know, uh, Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe, it, but that didn't lead him to do the remake of the spoilers at yep. Universal or something like that. No, they, these guys were all kind of in their niche. You said you said you bring up Flash Gordon because at this time now we're in the 30s. We're, we, we've scattered a little bit in, from the 40s back to the 30s. Yeah. But the big ones were really Universal. Columbia was they made the most and Republic. And then you had, you know, some other smaller ones. But Courtney, talk to me about how long it would take to film a serial because they ranged in chapters between 12 and 15. Occasionally you had one that was 13, which is weird, but whatever. <laughs> how long would it take, do you think, to film a 15 chapter serial? Well, you know, that's that's a little difficult to gauge just because uh it's one of the reasons why serials often had two directors. Yeah. Uh and so they could have multiple units going. And one director's taking care of all the stagecoach chases, and another director is shooting the close-ups with the principals uh, and their dialogue scenes. And uh, with each chapter being approximately 20 minutes, my guess would be that you were probably looking at, say, three and a half, maybe four days for each. Now, the serials generally, that's about, you know, five and a half hours of material. Yeah. And so, I, I, would, I would love when some serials had a recap chapter. Oh, yes. <laughs> and also, don't forget, like at Universal, for example, if you looked at, say, something like uh, uh, Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe, that chat, certain chapters are going to be built around stock footage. Yes. And that, be, that was sort of... I, Serials were the first really to play with stock footage. Am I right on that assessment? Like they yeah, were like to the to the extent that they did, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and and th this is the thing: the stock footage either it was from bigger movies, sometimes it was from newsreels, and it just depended on the the context. If you had a bad guy, and I always loved with the Republic uh, kind of cast list at the beginning of yeah. the chapters, and you know. Here's so and so. Here's so and so, and the Scorpion or whoever yeah. the bad guy was. They wouldn't tell you who was playing him. He just stand there looking fierce in his, uh, you know, outfit. The Crimson Ghost. Um, it's what I. The thing about the Crimson Ghost is the misfit stole it. And when I see guys walking around with the misfit sh sh misfit oh, shirts, bet. I just look at him and I just go, yeah. William Wickham. <laughs> yep, my Crimson Ghost. Oh, and, you said the scorpion. You, you have a if you have a bad guy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. Yep. But the, the bad guy's plans sometimes were a beautiful master plan for use of stock footage. Oh, absolutely. The destructions, especially in Adam Man versus you Superman. Bet. Forget about something. No. Uh, well, let's see. Hmm. Oh, I will show I this. Po I will show yeah, this man. power on the bridge today you at three o'clock. Yeah, the, this bridge is going to explode, or we're going to. Uh, Cause a lot of airplane crash, <laughs> and then you know, from every any era you can think of, they're you know smashing into the ground, and then cut to the bad guy going, "Oh, my plan's working perfectly." Or you cut to the the hero surrounded by the sparklers for a second. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> that was you know, it's all built into the production plans, and uh, one of the uh, producers at Universal who was in charge of an awful lot of uh, serials, Morgan Cox, uh, as they were phasing serial production out, Universal held on to him for yeah, him yeah. to finish out uh, the B-horror films like Spider-Woman Strikes Back. Yeah. So uh, they were wringing the last little bit of talent out of everybody. They there. definitely they squeezed that sponge. But, you know, the you funny bet. thing is, is that serials transli transitioned to television yep. almost seamlessly. But serials kept going until 56. And, hey, God bless them. But it was filmed television. It yes. It was syndicated. It was the Gene Autry show. It was Roy Rogers. The Long Captain Rangers. Video. Captain Video. Exactly. Yeah, it, it was not Playhouse ninety. It wasn't Blackhawk or anything like. But Blackhawk might have been part of that, maybe kind of. But it was or, filmed television, very often in sixteen millimeter. It, but uh, you know, they were not doing the prestige. Yes. TV, you know, yeah. 
What do you think, Courtney, is the finest cereal ever made from the golden age up until really the Spencer Gordon Bennett era? <laughs> I would, well, you know, I, again, we're, we're talking about all these, these different outfits and how they approach their cereals and stuff. Um, Let me reward it then. I would, of course, go to Republic. Um, I, I just, I, I love what they did with, of course, Captain Marvel. That, that just the, the best, the best, yeah, the and best. Rydecker's special effects and all that stuff. It's, it's still impressive. It's wonderful. And there's another actor, Tom Tyler, who came from the westerns. He was a B western guy, and a lot of those westerns are on Paramount Plus now, which is great for. For me, <laughs> oh, all the stuff he did at RKO. Well, and also, also, let's finally put this to rest. Put it to rest. This idea that Tom Tyler was so stricken with arthritis, he had to accept the role of Kyrus in the Mummy's Hand. I've heard that so many. I times. heard that story too. It's ridiculous. I heard that story too. I'm and like, you're really? Not have an arthritic Captain Marvel. It's you know. Sorry, guys. And, and I mean, and, what, and and for those who will watch this live, and those who will see it later, and this is an entirely different. This could be a show in its in it in itself. Captain Marvel today to modern people is called Shazam, but I will always call him Captain Marvel. So I just, I'm I'm putting that to rest. That's Captain Marvel, and that picture of Tom Tyler. How would you have an arthritic? Captain Marvel, and then two years later, an arthritic phantom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, we're bringing up uh, the costumes in Batman. That was one thing also Republic, uh, whether it was the Phantom or it was Captain America or Captain Marvel, those costumes looked like the characters. They looked like what we saw in the comic books and in comics. Yes, stories. yes. It wasn't some, you know, the floppy ears and, uh, you know, kind of ill-fitting outfits that you saw in the Columbia. Lewis Wilson sort of had the belt that came up to his armpits like Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> exactly. And so they, they really took care at Republic, I think. And part of it being, look, if they paid money to King Feature Syndicate or they paid money to uh, whoever it was uh, to license those characters, uh, they weren't going to throw good you know they weren't going to waste it they weren't going to throw good money after bad they wanted to get the best bang for their buck so it's like okay we were doing this but we've got to do it right because if we do it wrong you know we're sunk but what would what, what, take columbia with batman do you think columbia looked at any source material because when i look at the republic ones it to me it strikes they went to the fausa comics or the lee mm -hmm. falk i mean like they really like there was detail uh, so, so much that the phantom had the the striped uh, oh you bet oh yeah and I, yeah. you know you didn't see that in the billy zane movie not knocking the billy zane movie i love the billy zane movie but tom tyler was great tom tyler was awesome he was the ghost who walks and he was the ghost who walks you know it, it just just wonderful I, i'm sure the columbia guy of course i mean they had to be aware of what they were doing i think it literally was that they were going to only spend a certain amount of money uh, on this serial, because this is the thing, the interior shots with uh, J. Carol Nash talking on the secret phone to his agents and all that kind Number of stuff. Number five. That's it. <laughs> That's it, it man. Look, it looks great. It, it, it looked look, great. looks wonderful. Still you is. Get onto that old, shabby Columbia back lot, and I think they shot at the one that was down on Western Avenue, and suddenly the whole thing just, you know, you're like, wait a minute, what what is this? I mean, you're waiting for Leo Gorsi and Hunts Hall are come stumbling through. Uh, it looks, it really looks shabby. It does. And um, I but don't. It's fun. Yeah. But it is, again, it's, you're kind of, you know, scratching yourself and, you know, was everybody drunk when they did it or whatever, <laughs> whatever the issue was, you know, uh, there's not that uh, tightness and that dedication kind of to, those uh, original characters that you saw in the um, in the um, uh, Republic pictures. Now, where Universal, of course, scored big time, even though you still have those the silly rocket ships. But I honestly, I think the casting of Buster Crab as Flash Gordon is probably the best casting in the history of serials. 
I would agree with that. If visually, if nothing else, it, it it agreed. He had the look. He had the walk. He he had the he had it. He had the hair. He had the hair. He had yeah, it. It did. He looked like Alex Raymond's drawings, and uh, so that that stuff that was always uh, I think a big big advantage. Now, um, how many flash? There were two, three, three, three. three. You're right. Uh, flash Gordon. Uh, yeah. I, I watched those as a kid, and I have not rewatched them as an adult. That's the sad thing. And I was I, I see clips of them all the time on YouTube and on other channels because movies. Some of the movie serials are going into public domain, so they're easily accessible. Oh yeah, and Wait, I'm sorry, sorry, but if you want hotness, Ming's hotness. daughter. Ming's yeah. daughter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She she was a beautiful woman. Yeah, that's that. I mean, you know, God love Gene Rogers, and you know, I know she's Flash's girlfriend and everything, but I'm sorry, Ming's Ming's daughter. Yeah, holy cow. Yeah, yeah. But, um. uh, <laughs> but you know, there is then again, Universal going to. I think they did a very good job, but I love that uh, it's Key Luke as uh, Cato in the Green Hornet, which led to my, which led to another another name I wanted to bring up, Warren Hall. Warren Hall. God was yeah. Warren. Was Warren Hall cool, or is that just me? No, he was cool. He was cool. He played Mandrake, then the yeah. Spider, which I think the Spider's Web is phenomenal. I think the Spider's Web was awesome. And I'm not in the camp that of was, that was Columbia. Yes, and I'm not in the camp of knocking the Spider Returns. I thought Spider Returns was pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. And then taking over for Gordon Jones on the Green Hornet. Just yeah. those, just that Warren Hall delivery. You know, I haven't come to life until I've read the paper. You know, just he's so good. I love Warren Hall. And you know, but that was that was a thing too. Especially, it was especially true as we watched the Universals, only because we're so devoted to the the horror films and everything else. And you see, oops, oh look, there's Michael Mark, or yep. there's you know, my God, Lionel Atwill. Uh, he was in a couple. You bet. And so that was also the great fun because there's kind of the, the crossover between the genres and you, you see these guys. And also, too, uh, something we saw earlier, uh, but uh, the Westerns, and particularly the Westerns Universal did, I have a couple of uh, lobbies. In fact, here is, I think I've got, yeah, uh, here is the title card. Riders okay. of Death Valley. The Riders of Death Valley. We can kind of, there we go. And uh, to go with your ashtray, there's that. And then awesome. here is also because they put old Lon in a number of serials, of course. And here is one of his starring ones. Overland Mail, Chapter 2, The Flaming Havoc. And yeah, that's, that's and oh, and again, duo tone. But here is... Lon tied to the stake, and he's uh, you know, he's having some problems. Do you think we'll ever see a good full restoration of some of these serials that may look really cruddy by today's standards? Well, you know, that's that's the thing is, um, remember when nostalgia video was putting things out, and VC, yeah, yeah, I worked on um, I was on was it Shadows of Chinatown? I think it might have been. I honestly, I can't remember. Um, we did a uh, a thing for VCI. Also, uh, a, love v uh, love VCI. <laughs> and we um and uh, we did a whole thing called Lugosi Creeps, which was about his uh, his serials. Yeah. But the restoration of those serials. Now there was a restoration of Drums of Fu Manchu. And there's one coming out of the Green Hornet in April, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. These guys doing the Green Hornet, but the only the original, they're not doing strikes strikes again. It strikes again, right? And so, and it's you know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. When we did uh, for Film Detective, when Dan Griffith and I did uh, the Tarzan Vault, yeah, there was a restoration of the Herman Bricks Tarzan Zero. They really did a job on that. They found this fantastic expert. To do, who did a commentary on every single chapter. Really? But the amount of time and effort and who, how large is the buying audience for this type of stuff, those are all the questions that unfortunately they, come into the decision-making. They take that into consideration. They sure do. Because money walks and you know what talks. 
And Universal, I think if they did, say, a collection of what they considered their best cereals, I think that would actually sell. But who is going to put in that effort to do it, unfortunately? You so, would, would you? Well, yeah, but, you know, you, you have to kind of, they kind of pick and choose what they think actually will, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, be popular. And also that's why some of the smaller companies are the ones doing it because the rights to this stuff, if they fall into the public domain, they starve them up. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes now, without doing anything to them. That's the thing. Like you could probably, what's one that just went into public domain. I read it today. Green Archer, Green Archer fell into public domain. Grab Green Archer and you, they slap it on and they do their own commentary. Absolutely. And not a knock, but that's what they do. Well, you remember back, uh, I still have a couple of the nostalgia video, uh, you know, Republic serials on yeah. VHS. And yeah, I mean, the quality, the quality is what the quality is. We were happy to have it at the time. Yep. But now the, the possibility of doing something so much better and all that mascot stuff. It used to come out on Sinister Cinema and every, you know Hurricane Express and all that stuff, and boy, some of that was really you know really kind of tough to watch. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a good. I had read that the Lone Ranger strikes the second one with Livingston uh, yeah. strikes back, strikes again, strikes again. Yeah, uh, I that looks like crap. Like yeah, to the point of not being watchable. And I have never seen a good cut transfer of anything. And this can go back to the rights in a second. Captain Africa. <laughs> oh, God. You know, again, you know, you're looking at also a lot of the stuff. I remember TCM started to run. Well, they're running Batman right now. but They, they are running Batman running right now. Some of the, the Columbias. In fact, one of the, and you can, it's behind me right there. I'm touching the edge of it. My half sheet to uh, Mysterious Island. The reason Columbia had Mysterious Island is because they did the can Sam Katzman's Serial. Yeah. Now, how, yeah. now you brought up Sam Katzman. How did he get involved in movie serials and just sort of just knock them out like an assembly line? Jungle Sam Katzman. Well, Jungle you know, Sam. That was, that was really where he started. Uh, and remember, too, he did that early uh, Buster Crab uh, serial that was supposed to compete with Tarzan. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, Lion Man? Yeah, it, it was something like that. It was like a Lion Man or not an Ape Man or a Leopard Man. Obviously not Leopard and, Man, but something like so that. He was always, but that was that was the thing. He was always on that uh, verge Rip with outfits like Mascot and uh, those companies before he, if you will, graduated to Monogram. Yeah. And of course, the Lugosi Monogram 9 and uh, the East Side Kids and what have you. And he established his own unit over there. But when he went to Columbia and stayed there forever, uh, forever, you bet. And then uh, you know he took over for the um, all the Sam Katzman pick or, or serials right to the very end. Do you think though, if you would going back a hair, you had said if Universal released what they thought were the best motion, the best movie serials, the same could be said by Columbia or even Republic VCI, whatever you want to call it now in the in this day and age. The only ones that I feel like really transcended the test of time, if you will, were the resurgence of the superhero movies in the mid twenty in the early twenty first century, because that's how only a lot of these people ever heard of the Batman oh, and things like that. Absolutely. That's the, Captain America. Come on, there's another one that makes you. Yeah. What the What the hell is uh oh oh District Attorney Grant Gardner is Captain America well, that's not the Captain America we grew up with Courtney at all <laughs> it was weird sometimes these changes that were initiated um, and it's like guys no let's stick to what people are reading in the comic strips let's stick to what they're reading in the comic books um, I would have loved to have heard what uh, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon thought of the Captain America serial. Oh, I would have loved to have heard that story. That would have that. It's not good, in my opinion. I I'm don't sure. Think. It, yeah, it's it isn't good, and you kind of wonder why because they had done well elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, and, and it really is kind of a hit and miss proposition. I mean, I have that you know title card from the Phantom Creeps, and I love the movie paper on on that uh, serial and it's expensive now um but 
I think a lot of people, and they finally, because now you can see the Phantom Creeps and it's been cleaned up and everything else, and you're kind of waiting for the robot to do something. <laughs> and it looks fantastic, and it comes out of the panel in the wall and all that, and there's Bella Lugosi, you know, I will conquer everyone. I will conquer. And he just kind of, he does this, and he does that, and then kind of, you know, are you familiar with those guys over at Serial Squadron? Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, I've been on their site. Sure. God, God bless them because they're doing everything in their power. But that eighty, that eighty-seven or eighty-eight-year-old guy who had all the reels in his room. Come, did you see that yep. picture? I was like, holy, you know what? Holy crap! Well, you know that was that's another reason that that actually so much of this has been preserved is through the private collectors. I, I knew a yeah. fellow back when I was growing up in Pittsburgh and he was, he was an older man and he owned a dry cleaners or something. And he was obsessed with collecting cereals. So 16 millimeter reels of cereals. That's all he was interested in. Just like there were guys I knew who collected what, cause I was collecting 16 for a little while and all they wanted was B movies or uh, B Westerns. You know, I'll trade you three Bob Steels for one Tom Tyler or whatever it was. And that's all they did and all they were focused on. So those movies, the fact that anything decent exists for us on home, uh, home media is because of these private collectors who preserved it. That's incredible. Yeah, that's I, 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 I'm thinking about actually buying a 16 millimeter myself, but that's a story I'll I'll share with you another time <laughs> but it's a, oh here's also another uh color piece i've got it's just sitting here like an orphan but uh one of the uh bigger in the sci-fi serials that uh we love there's undersea kingdom undersea kingdom yep okay he's not in the uh shot but uh, lon cheney's in this one that's a unique one. I haven't seen that one in a long, long time. Yeah. Oh, oh go back. There we go. Undersea Kingdom. And let's be honest, Court that Courtney, there there are some of these movie serials that are not good. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like everything else. There are Yeah, I mean yeah. they were grinding them out and what have you. We had a wonderful birthday party for Clue Gulliger years ago. God rest his soul. Watched- uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'm always going to miss him. And yeah. we had a little, there was a screening up at the Autry, and we arranged for it. His, his uh, son and daughter in law arranged for it because uh, Clue loved Phantom Empire. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so we all went up there. We watched a couple of chapters of the Phantom Empire. And of course, that the Autry loved it because that was yep. Gene. And, you know, we're all loving it because of those robots and, you know, Frankie Darrow and all that stuff. But you're right. I mean, uh, just like anything else, the quality definitely varied. I'm sure that, uh, you know, head of production coming into an office uh, to Ronald Davidson and saying, uh, OK, uh, we, we just bought the rights to blankety blank. Uh, we need a script in two weeks. Uh, get going. <laughs> you ever sit through you ever sit through a movie serial four hours straight you ever you ever brave it i never have uh i'm <laughs> always you know i br- break it i'll usually do two and two yeah but uh and when you get to the really threadbare ones like the mascot stuff you talk about the stunts and you see these guys on mulholland drive flipping cars over and everything else <laughs> jumping out of the way at the last minute that's because they were actually doing it. They were doing they, it, man. They, they, there yeah. was no BS with them. Nope. How about another? How about another name from the serial past? That my, I'll tell you this story. My father never liked this guy, but I think he's okay. Not Warren Hull cool, but he's still cool in my book. Victor Jory. Okay, now Vic <laughs> Jory. Yeah, I understand your dad's feelings. Vic Jory was, you know, he was a. <laughs> He was a tough guy and he used to do a lot of, you know, brawling and stuff. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, I'm not that big on uh, the spider. The one that, was Warren. that was Warren Hall. No, didn't Vic- Victor Jory do a... Uh... 
He was the shadow. He was the shadow. Okay. Big George, and he is not the definitive shadow. Uh, no. Period. I'll agree with you on that. Yeah, I was not. Then that was Columbia. Yes. Yeah. So Vic that's Jory, that, he, he, he was also the Green Archer, I think. Yes, he was. And I much prefer Victor Jory, honestly, in because he's such a good heavy. So he's a good I heavy. Love, love to see him in uh, Dodge City. That's one of the things about Victor Jory I like. I'm like, why is this guy Lamont Cranston? I'm like, he he's better off as the bad guy. I agree with yeah, you 100% on that. Yeah. <laughs> Victor, uh, Victor Jory. Yep. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, we, we talk about, uh, and of course, we haven't touched on the on the ladies. I'll tell you, um, I got to spend uh, time around Peggy Stewart. Oh yeah. Who was? Oh, she was so so nice, and she used to always do the Lone Pine uh, Film Festival. And I was up there uh, one year signing books and stuff, and Peggy was there, and she had a lot of people around her table. And I went over to talk to her, and uh, she she was always so nice to me. And here was the thing, and I thought this was so interesting. Lone Pine. Now, here we are, you know, the location for so many, all of oh, yeah. great stuff. And there she was with a stack of Gene Autry and a stack of Roy Rogers, and her third stack of photos totally sold out. Really? Last screen appearances was she guest starred on Justified. And she had no a shit. shot of herself with Tim Oliphant. Yep. And that's what sold out. No shit. That's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Coming back, or had it already come back? And oh no, it's it's coming back. It's there, coming back. It justified. Yeah. It's coming back. City, City primeval, absolutely. That's the thing. There's no more originality, Courtney. It's just, they're just rehashing new stories with the old characters. Dutch Leonard, for fuck originality. No, this is. Awful. <laughs> yeah. Please leave that in. I am leaving that in. I, <laughs> I've only, I'll tell you, in 127 episodes, I've only had to edit two episodes. You can cut out my Victor Jory gaff if you want to. That's not at all. It's, it's, it's nothing like live. Nothing like my snafu when the computer crapped out. I don't know why the why. I don't think I'll ever be able to have eight people on like we did in August. Do you remember that? Oh, that, that was, was great. That was a lot of fun. That oh, we're doing it again this August. I said that it, as soon as we stopped. I'm like, we're gonna, we're gonna, because after you and DG left and some of the other people, more people showed up. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I was like, there's no way the internet would have survived with, with 10 people. Cause that's the max you could have is 10. And I was like, Oh boy. Like just, I was like shutting phones down and shutting stuff down. It was like a classic movie serial recording. Like we need more power. <laughs> yeah. That's like, yeah. That's like, uh, you know, when your car's overheating and you're shifting uh, yeah, from cold, yeah. cold to hot. Yep. Yes. Yeah. That, and that's a, that, trust me, that's a crappy feeling. <laughs> now, going back to the serials, though, uh, God love them. I mean, how can we not talk about supposedly what is the most financially, the, the best, highest grossing movie serial of all time? Superman with Kirk Allen. Come on. Is that really the most lucrative serial of all well, time? Well, of course, because it was Superman. And uh, you have that early thing with with, with noel neal and um i kind of carol enjoyed foreman. carol foreman is the spider lady yep and she and was I in the falcon of... too she was in the falcon how do you feel about the animated flying not, not a fan i thought it's cheap i'll be honest i like the superman serial i can respect it it's not my favorite but once he went animated i was like I mean, like Captain Marvel just had this these great effects seven years prior with the. Well, they the, built a Captain Marvel and the, put him the, on wires, and yo, oh, yeah. I can admire Alan on the screen like this, you know, doing that with the smoke. But when it goes animated, I just kind of—I'll give him that. They meshed it very well. I'll say yeah. that. Well, they that took effort, but just—I mean, it's probably one of the—it's why I don't like CGI sometimes. <laughs> Nothing against it. I, I I own it. And you know who's in the documentary for that DVD set that Warner that was that Warner Brothers who did the docu, the, the DVD in two thousand six? Because you I remember when so, yeah. you remember when Superman Returns came out? It was just this yeah. barrage of Superman merch, all the way from Superboy to the George Reeves to the Kirk Allens to the Dean Cains. Everything it was our boy, your your friend Don Glute. 
That's right. And he and he knew his stuff. Don Don was and Bob Burns. They were interviewed. That that was actually my first exposure to Don. And yeah, we're doing um, uh, what Dinosaur Valley Girls? I guess that was that. That's a Don Glute movie. Yeah, no, I'm going to be doing it with no. I mean, I see Don all the time. You know. We're, yeah. We're we're frequent lunch companions. He's he, a good guy. He he is. I I met him at Terrificon last year, right around the time we did that big eight person show. And I'll tell you, it's seeing Don in person. Now I will say this: when I saw Don, I had my Invaders thirty one right with Frankenstein's monster against the Invaders. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is I went to Don. He vaguely remembered me once I explained to him my connection with you and everything like that. Then he remembered, and I went like this to Don. I said, "Hold on one second, sir. I have one book I'd like for you to sign." Now, when I came back, there was somebody who kind of did the old oh, in front yeah. of me, and I was like, "Like I wasn't ready to go," but I look, I'm like, "Wow!" And he's talking to Don about. And I'm not, I can't speak for Don. Because I know when we spoke, he didn't want to talk about The Empire Strikes Back. That's all this guy could mark out about was Empire Strikes Back. And I'm with Dunzilla. And you remember Dunzilla? I looked over at yeah. Dunzilla. I just looked over. I just smiled. And I'm like, Star Wars. <laughs> That's it. That's it. But Don then signed my Invaders 31, which is right over there. And I loved it. Don's a great guy. Love him to death. But yeah. he was he was tremendous to talk to for a couple of minutes in person. He told me you were watching your cats, and then you confirmed that story. Oh, yes. That's that's right. That's when that was going on. Absolutely. <laughs> I was like, bring him next year. Bring him next year. Oh well, you know, we could have we could have had a cigar in the cigar bar <laughs> yeah. and reminisced about the movie serials. Well, you uh, know, Tommy, it's it really is this kind of, I would love to see the rebirth. I'd love to see uh, people like recognizing Kay Aldridge and, you know, all these wonderful actresses and all they were doing, all anybody was doing in the serials really was earning their stripes. They were earning a paycheck and they were, they were doing their their thing. They were doing it, whether it was in front of the camera, behind the camera, Fra Flash Gordon conquers the universe. There's Anne Gwynn. You know, and she's like, yeah, whether it's Strange Case of Dr. Rx or Black Friday or House of Frankenstein or whatever, everybody was just switching around. They were reporting to work. They were working. They were, they were doing their duty. That's absolutely uh, it. The big movie serial coming out in April, we said earlier, was the Green Hornet re-release because they did, they did a version of it in 2011 with that Seth Rogen abomination. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really think it's going to look as much look much better than what it did in 2011. Do you know anything about no, that? I, I don't think so either. I don't know that new source material has been discovered or anything like that. And um, I remember my back when we lived in Philadelphia, I got into a real argument. Well, how? Because we were eight years old uh, <laughs> with, with my best friend. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I maintain that the Green Hornet could beat up Batman. He could. Yeah, damn right. Are you, yeah, Bruce Lee versus Burt Ward? I'm sorry. <laughs> did that really cause that big of a rift? I've, I've heard that story when they did the crossover that they wanted Burt Ward to go over on, on Bruce Lee, and he just had none of it. And it, it almost turned into what you saw in Once Upon a Time in, a, in a Hollywood. But if I, had to be, if I had to choose Van Williams and Adam West in a fist fight, I gotta go, Van. You bet. Absolutely. I gotta. I gotta go, Van. Now, if it was Warren Hull versus Lewis Wilson, draw. <laughs> yeah. Well, it really probably would depend on how much each of them had to drink. Was Warren Hull a boozer? Because I found a video no, of him. I on don't know. I doubt uh, it. I mean, you know, I, he, uh, well, no, I saw a picture of him uh, when he was doing uh, what's that show? It was a game. I, I just went on YouTube and looked up Warren Hull, and it was God. What's get um uh, shit? I have a secret, or guess oh, my line. I got a secret. Oh, okay. Or guess my line, or something like that. Yeah, what's my line? And I, I looked at his eyes, and I'm like, that guy may have had a few long nights in his life. Don't know, never, you know. I don't know any. I don't have any good Warren Hall stories. Never, nor did I ever read no, any. I don't either. 
I'm sure he was a nice man. <laughs> well, he was cool. That's why we like. He him. was cool, man. He was he was cool. I, I wouldn't put him Tom Conway cool, but I would put him. There's another guy like the the. I'm surprised they never did a serial, even though they were under contract. RKO never did. R RKO never had a serial. Well, Dick Tracy. That's true. Morgan. Uh, uh, um. Um. Well, Ralph Bird. Ralph Bird. Yeah. It was a weird thing because. I remember one day I was with Lawrence Tierney and we were talking about Dick Tracy because I knew he'd been up for the part. Yes, I had heard that. I had heard that rumor. And um, he thought he still had his screen test. We were rummaging around the apartment looking for the, the 35 reel. He said somebody had given it to him at some point. But this was when they were switching. Probably, you know, when they were doing the features and when they were doing the series, it's all kind of, you know, almost uh simultaneously which is a little strange yeah because you would have thought it was like oversaturation of dick tracy because then they switched from ralph bird to morgan conway and that and i'm not i'm not in the hating conway camp i thought morgan yeah. conway was actually pretty good that's actually when they were testing larry to take over dick tracy from ralph bird so he would have done the two pictures that conway had done exactly yeah which were what what was it, gruesome and cue ball no, gru gruesome's uh gruesome Ralph Bird. Ralph Bird. Gruesome yeah. was Ralph. So it's been cue ball and God. Cue ball was one of them. Yeah, cue ball, and I'm trying to think of what the last one was. But yeah. Dilemma? So, I don't know if it was Dilemma. Is it Dick Tracy's Dilemma? It could be. Could be. And maybe. We'll figure yeah, it out. That's the thing. There was RKO's commitment to serials. Other than trying to get the most they could out of uh, Chester Gould's character, that was that was really about it. They milked uh, this. They milked that character. They did. And uh, you know, you go back to Universal, and again, look, Carl Lemley. For him, the serials were his like barely the flickering, you know, <laughs> introduction to movies when he was in his twenties. So. And let's not forget too, with 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 serials and that visual language and everything else. And we always kind of forget this. They movies were designed and thinking of an audience that could not speak English or read it. Yeah, yeah. So that was a big part of the way the movies were approached when they were invented, and serials so inhabit i think that philosophy in so many ways and they just continued whether it doesn't matter you can turn the sound off and you're still going to understand the cliffhanger now talk to me about the origin of a cliffhanger i went that that was like where i mean i know where it is but for the viewer the origin of the cliffhanger because every serial up until the final chapter when the bad guy gets his comeuppance the hero is always in some Odd death trap, driving towards a cliff, poisoned room. And then they stop. Yep. And, Tune in you know, next week at this to, theater. To bring you back for the next week. But I think the thing is with, with the cliffhangers, um, which, uh, you know, they even did that stuff on radio. Uh, tune in next week to Tune see. Tune in next week how the yeah, Adventures so of the so Green Hornet yeah, end. Of, yeah, this, this particular death trap. But I think one of the things with cliffhangers that really – became the uh, benchmark of them was when you returned, they showed you how the hero got out of peril. You got that one minute recap. Too. You got the one minute recap, but they're showing you something you didn't see yes. the previous week. Oh my gosh. The, the, the green Hornets car exploded. Then when you come back, Oh look, there he is rolling out of the car just before <laughs> the black beauty explodes. And you didn't see him roll out of the car the previous week. So that was, uh, yeah. There's that great speech in Misery. Yeah. You remember when Kathy Bates talked yeah. about how mad she got it when she found out that the cliffhangers were phony? Yeah. Yep. Very good movie, Misery. Yes. 
<sighs> but of course, but you've never done the four hour. I, I've been tempted to to try to do it. I've been tempted. I would probably do it with one of the superhero ones because I just feel like I have more of a connection to the the superhero genre. Well, you know, it, to yeah, sit with with Captain Marvel or something that really was kind of elevated beyond its station. Then I would say yes, but a regular, you know. Yeah, like a monster in the ape, you couldn't, you could barely do a chapter. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you get through it because we love it and all that stuff. And in fact, Overland Mail, and I cannot remember the title of it, uh, was actually sections of that were cut down to a 200 footer by Castle Films, but retitled. Really? Yes. And I think it was called like Indian Raiders or something. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, if you're suddenly, you know, if you're Lon Chaney Jr. completist, and I really should get that real. I used to have it. I don't know what happened to it. But, yes, it does exist that there is an overland male 200-foot silent 8-millimeter Castle Films version. I know what you're going to be looking up tonight on eBay. Oh, or... <laughs> you know, this going back to Don Glute for a second, he wrote a book on movie serials, did he not, back in the 70s? He did. And, uh, well, Don, uh, because of his own interest, and, of course, he had done his own Captain Marvel movie. Yes, yes. I uh, yeah, loved all that know, stuff. Did he tell you how he did the thing with Captain Marvel flying? No. He okay. never told me. Talk to me, because I've seen most of his stuff. Is he cut a picture of Tom Tyler's Captain, cut him out of either a copy of Screen Thrills Illustrated or something. He taped it to the passenger window of his mom's car. <laughs> he drove around the neighborhood and he filmed the little thing with everything passing behind it. That's how we did it. That's awesome. Yep. It's original. It's creative. Very. Captain Marvel. With uh, Gerald Moore doing the, the Scorpion's voice. That's right. Who then went on to do the narration of the Lone Ranger for... 18 episodes or whatever it was real quick. You were talking about the rights for a second. I had mentioned captain Africa. So that was supposed to be the phantom. Yes. <laughs> so instead it turned into John Hart wearing like a shirt that looks like mine with khaki pants and a football helmet. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't, you know, Lee Falk, uh, would not make the deal. And, uh, you know, and now there's a again that estate. Uh, you know, they they're they're the new phantom novels and oh yeah, all all of this stuff going on. I'd love to take a crack at one of those. And there, uh, and with Robert Evans bought the rights uh, to a whole bunch of King features material. Remember, because of Popeye and everything else, he kind of oh, yeah. up a lot of stuff at that time. Now where all the individual rights leap now. I don't know. And does that even affect uh, the old Republic serial? It may not. I'd love to see the Phantom again. And like you just said, I'd take a, I'd love to see you take a crack at one of those. Yeah. And that's, oh, I, I love the Phantom. And one of the reasons I think the Phantom is so cool and why it's endured is there's no supernatural element to the Phantom. No. Uh, it's, a gener this, it's a generational thing. It's a generational thing, right, passed down from father to son. And I find that, I think that's just such a cool origin that it's not touching a rock from outer space or, you know, whatever the hell it is or being bitten by God knows what insect that gives you superpowers. It's like a uh, family responsibility. Exactly right. And th that's just so completely different than, like, the origin of almost any other superhero you can think of. He's like I, Prince Valiant, you know. I mean, it's it uh, is. it's neat. Yeah, I do remember uh, watching Defenders of the Earth, though, and I thought it was cool that you had Flash Gordon, the Phantom, and Mandrake. I remember when when Lee died. Oh God, when did he die? I, did he? I maybe twenty, maybe twenty years ago ish. Oh yeah, at least yeah. Maybe maybe twenty five, but I remember seeing a picture of him uh, with the the pen, you know. And in the background, 
Mandrake and the Phantom and Mandrake taking his hat off to kind of. Well, you know, because I mean, I know that that image and, you know, Tom, this is the thing, it, including me. I always thought that Lee Falk was the artist. Agreed. And he was not. He, he was, was not. The writer. He was the writer. But he, there he insisted or it was rightly so saying, no, 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 I'm the creator of the Phantom. I'm not going to get kicked off my own thing. Yeah. Which, you know, was consistently happening with other creators who wrote and drew their creations, of course, including, Joe, you know, Siegel Bob, and Schuster. Little Bob uh, Kane esque. Bob, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bob Kane. I just, I just thought uh, that was really interesting and that his image was so attached to his creations. And it, that, was a, that was smart. He was that a was. Smart man. He was a smart businessman. Sure. Going back to Mandrake for a second. Mandrake the Magician, great serial, great Warren Hall. What's with the dubbing? <laughs> Have you seen that? If you if you look, you know what I'm talking oh, gosh, about. It's been so long since I've seen Mandrake. Um, I mean, they turn him into Dick Tracy. It's not like he's using you know the magic card tricks and the, you know it's, right. he's basically a magician on a cruise ship. But I'm like, that's not Warren Hall's voice at all. So I'm assuming there's a quality issue that. They paid some VO artist, the VO guy to come in and redub it. And I'm just like, yeah. yeah, it's kind of um not quite as artfully done as Frankenstein created woman, but yeah, there's a there's a problem there. <laughs> Frankenstein created woman was awesome. That was on Sven Gulliet. No, what was the one on Sven Gulli less than a year ago? I think it was Frankenstein. Uh, it was the dude in space. Oh, Frankenstein meets the space monster? That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, that was on Sven There Gould. you go. Yeah, I'm they like, shot that in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I'm watching this, and I'm like, I hadn't watched it probably 15 years, and I'm like, wow. James Karen. <laughs> I have the 8 millimeter version of that. Wow. Yeah. It's an all right movie for what it is. <laughs> uh. Seven and a half minutes, black and white, silent. It plays really well, yeah. <laughs> Talk to me. One of the things I would like to get, not, I don't want to get into it. I don't have, I don't think, I, there are a few movies I see 16 millimeter reels or eight millimeter reels or whatnot. Is that a collector's thing or is that something that like completionists like need and want? Talk to me about that. Cause like I come from a collect, you know, comic books and, books well, and things like that but like you know, the biggest thing when i was i remember i because i finally would you know would, would have a little bit of money i started collecting 16 millimeter in in high school okay yeah i am like 300 years older than you so you, you have to you know think about this um so 1975 19 this stuff wasn't even readily available you know this was uh, you didn't find it right <laughs> pre betamax you know it was forget it. it you know nothing existed so to have a 16 print of earth versus the flying saucers or whatever it was that me and my friends could watch at any time we wanted that was great that was like you know heaven on earth <laughs> and so that was the, really the propelling factor in so much of that uh, because you wanted to have access to this stuff. And I had, I loved having the eight millimeters and everything else. But again, that was just like, I would love to see Revenge of the Creature tonight. Well, I can't, but I can see nine minutes of it. And so that's what, you know, really got all that going. Now, once VHS started and everything else and everything became available and then cable TV, I mean, now there's just no reference point to a world in which all this stuff exists. I understand. So, uh, but now, you know, people still collect 16 millimeter, but it's a very specialized market. It's not, um, uh, oh gosh, when I was in college, some friends of mine and I found out that underneath the Shrine Auditorium was a 16 millimeter clearing house. And a buddy of ours said, why don't you come on down here and take what you want? Thousands of movies. So what'd you grab? Oh, God. I got about 100. Some of my mother buddy of mine got about 200. I said, are we allowed to do they? They're like, yeah, go, go, go. 
A lot of them, most of them were prints. A lot of them were airline prints and they were on cores. So, man, we had, you know, Golden Girl and Escape to Athena and the Cassandra Crossing just coming out of our ears. I went into the dusty corner and came out with It Conquered the World and Not of This Earth and Attack of the Crab Monsters and the Indestructible Man. I found the Allied Artist stash. Nice. The hypnotic eye, all that stuff. And it was on reels. It wasn't on course. Isn't it funny whenever we, like, you you know, this story you're saying or whatever, whenever a group goes in to a place like that, somehow they always end up where they want to be. Well, we've got that radar. It's you know? like, it, it, it really is like yeah. a sixth sense where they're like, all right. Yeah, I mean, I'm like going around and going, okay, Susan Anton, Allison Hayes, and then <laughs> And off I went. Yeah. Yeah. No, the only reason I brought that up is I saw a 16 millimeter of the Falcon in Hollywood. And I was sort of, and I have the DVD and I was just sort of like, Ooh, that would be cool to have. Well, you know, I mean, I have a, you know, a very nice, uh, uh, you know, a uh, video projector and, you know, you said, I wish I had a, a regular projection room. But uh, I set it up, and it's a it's a ball, and to literally, you know, throw on the Blu-ray or the 4K of Once Upon a Time in the West and see it, you know, all the way across the wall because I've got the, one of the big screens. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic, and it didn't cost me fourteen hundred dollars to buy <laughs> a widescreen, you know, print of the movie. If you could get it fourteen hundred. So stick with the DVD is what you're you're silently. Well, you know, again, there, there are certain things. Um, I love having my eight millimeters just because it's fun, and I love the boxes and all yeah. of that stuff, and that's so much a part of my growing up. But you know, it's one thing about keeping sixteen millimeter prints. That's maintenance, and you're watching out for vinegar syndrome and all of that stuff, and they've got to remain clean and. What I mean, that's a lot of work to maintain your collection well. Now, if you want to have a couple of prints and throw them on, the, the Falcon goes to Hollywood and suddenly there it is. I mean, there is something about 16 mil. It is film and you hear it going through the gate and all of that stuff. And yeah, it's, you know, it's wonderful. It's a whole nother, you know, sensory experience. Yeah, that's one of the things, but we'll see. Next time we talk, I'll let you know if I pulled the trigger on that oh, one. Good deal. Uh, do you think movie serials are appreciated now in 2023 than they were perhaps 20 years ago, Courtney? No. No. It's dying. Well, I don't want to say it's dying. I, I'm saying that it needs – ultimately, they will be rediscovered because uh, I think there at least there are certain serials that are being given – a new chance at life because oh, yeah. they were restored and cleaned up and all that type of stuff. But the memory of serials and the memory of what they meant to audiences of a certain age, that is phasing out because the people are phasing out. People. You know? Yeah. That's just the yeah. sad thing. I, I wish I could have seen one of these in the theater. I really truly do. Cause you know, when you have the DVD of the, of, you know, I got Batman right here. I don't, have, I don't have to wait a week to watch chapter one. I can just hit play next. No, that's it. And, and you know, Tom, the thing is, too, when, when uh, you know, uh, Sam Sherman and those guys were reintroducing theatrical audiences to serials back in the very early 60s. An and evening then, with Batman and Robin. That's it. <laughs> and that, that was really an unusual thing. And... Um, you know, most of the serials, that was why they were cut into features is so Republic could sell them to television. But sell them to television as features, not as chapter plays. I've seen the Green Hornet feature they did when they, they bastardized the 1940 version where I'm like, you they took out all the cliffhangers and they took out the part where Cato fought three guys. I'm like... You bet. I'm like, all right. Hey, there was five bucks I spent. <laughs> But that's, you know, it was that was the demand or what they thought was the demand of the marketplace at the time. And so that was how they meant it. Wow. And that meant scattering a lot of footage and blood on the floor. 
<laughs> but you know, Herb Yates and those guys, I didn't care. I mean, this was uh, you know, just celluloid to them. I had to explain to someone that the Green Archer was not the Green Arrow. I had that like right. Yep. But because they were different characters. The Green Archer came yep. from the, the book and I'm like, they're different. They're not even really the same. <laughs> well, in the last cha in chapter 15 of this movie serial discussion, I love them. I will continue to love them till the day I'm no longer on this planet. I think they're fun. I think they're entertaining. They're a product of a time for uh, that is greatly forgotten. And what can I say? They're fun. Well, the good ones are really good. And and the thing is, you brought up a really good point about, the, you know, as uh, broadcast television, you know, kind of took over yep. the B-movie world and, and things like that. Certainly the serial world. Yes. Because essentially serials stopped in 1956. That, that was it. It was like and dead, R.I.P. It was dead. Absolutely chopped off the end. But you go back and you look at uh, Captain Marvel or... Flash Gordon conquers the universe or whatever it is. And suddenly you're saying, Hey, wait a minute. This is good. Raiders of the lost Ark. This is star Wars. This is all of these other things that have come into our lives since serials stop production, but they're the, the shadow or the influence and impact and all that stuff has continued. Yeah. Because of these other films, because of Spielberg and Lucas and all these guys, yeah, because they loved them too. Indiana Jones was the son of movie serials, Star Wars was the son God, of Flash yes. Gordon, totally, absolutely correct. But, but then again, then the Indiana Jones, in a way, quasi had their own children using that terminology with Alan Grant or the Marvel well, characters, you, you know. know. When uh, when people see Flash Gordon, the serial for the first time, and they see a that clock. That, that crawl, you bet, going away from us again. They're like, wait a minute, where <laughs> I've seen yeah. that before, yes. <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, 1937 or whatever it was. Uh, not, uh, yeah, they don't believe it. It's like, it's like they're in disbelief every time they see the the influence of the past. Like, that's it's right. Not, and not everything was completely original in Star Wars, let's be completely honest. And he just sort of took. That's not a knock on Lucas, Kirchner, Marquand, who I feel like gets no love, the director of Return of the Jedi. And it's a blender of every great story. Yep. Now came a very good trilogy. Trilogies. First two. <laughs> I always loved the story about how Peter Cushing was cast in the first movie. Yeah. Yeah. There they were prepping, and they were at Hammer House. Mm -hmm. They're on Wardour Street. And George Lucas kept seeing the poster for Frankenstein must be destroyed like every single day. Yeah. It just like stuck with him. Yeah. <laughs> so there you, yep, there you go. But a lot of that was, was a lot of that is how the film industry is correct. Like, yes, you see someone who you loved as a kid or a younger man and you get the opportunity to work with them. And obviously, it's got to be like a pinch me moment, Courtney. You've probably been, you've had that moment a couple oh, of times. Sure. I'm sure. Oh gosh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. They were, were asking me some questions about transfers, and I said, "Look," and it happened because Andy Robinson's wife was my agent. Yeah. But when I saw Dirty Harry for the first time, and I was 13 years old, if that's how old I was too, actually. There, there you go. That's I, all I want to say. Yes, but yes. Yeah. But um, if you had told me that Scorpio would be the bad guy in a movie I was going to direct, I would have fainted right there. I almost fainted when it happened. I mean, this is that was just incredible to me. That that is that's one of the best feelings. I know my limitations as who I am as a as on this bad for your health thing. I know who I am. I and I know what it is. But if you had told, I, I said this to Chelsea. Right to be actually for those who are watching. Yes. Um, I said if you had told me, in two thousand five, when Transfers Three was set, by the way, that you and I would would somehow have hooked up in the world, I the eighteen year old me would have just, nope, I don't believe it. <laughs> same same with a lot of the other people that I've spoken to. I don't believe you. 
I don't well, believe you're, you. <laughs> you're a very nice, misguided youth. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. I was guided a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Forged my own path. Uh, what's next for you, Courtney, in closing and uh, uh, sort of our, our movie serial epilogue? What do you got coming up? If you, uh, what what can you share? <laughs> well, I can, what I can share. Um, the, uh, yeah, we're do, doing so many commentaries and, and, uh, restorations and stuff. Uh, next coming out and that's next week is, uh, the big gun down from big gun down. Uh, indicator. Uh, that was an old commentary I actually did with Henry Park for Bob Morowski for a Grindhouse. And then Indicator just poured it over. They bought the whole kit and caboodle. Then after that, also with Henry, I did uh, Death of a Gunfighter. Yep. Uh, and uh, that was uh, for Arrow. And then we have uh, coming. Oh, then uh, Thrillers from the Vault from Mill Creek. Can't uh, wait. Finally, yes. Then, oh my gosh. The Monster Party guys did The Boogeyman Will Get You and uh, just uh, just wonderful. Uh, should have called me Should have called me for Creature with the Atom Brain. I would have done yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, Creature with the Atom Brain on Sci-Fi from the Vault went to uh, <laughs> Thief Sutton and Mark Legan. And I'm sorry. And uh, Steve Haberman did The Black Room on Thrillers from the Vault. Justin Humphreys and I did uh, It Came From Beneath the Sea. And uh, oh, and speaking of one of our great uh, podcast compatriots, Heath Holland, I tagged oh, yeah. him to do. We did um, the man they could not hang. Good movie. And he he'd never done it before. Never did a commentary. Yeah, he was great. Not that I'm judging. I've never done one either. But yes, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your phone's about to ring, so I wouldn't. You can but, keep me keep me in the loop, Courtney. If you ever need yeah. a, if, you, if you ever need backup, I'm a good third stringer. <laughs> but we've got uh, so that stuff. Uh, Requiem for heavyweight. Uh, then I'm doing the Arabian Night set. Uh, also the Bounty, and um, the original. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, the the Mel Gibson Anthony Hopkins, but they have me on camera talking about every version of Mutiny on the Bounty. No shit, you're doing that. Yeah, I'm doing that. And then also, uh, uh, also from uh, with imprint. Daniel Day Lewis too, mind you. That'd be That's the right. And also from Imprint, a uh, film noir set. I'm on that. And then, oh, and now you know, Kino's asked me to help out on some Audie Murphy titles, and and I've got a possibly another couple of Don Siegel things coming up, and everything else. So you know, plus uh, those little documentaries and. You know, there's always you know You're always, another writing assignment on the stove, but who knows what boils over. You're always going, Courtney. Trying one to stay of, out of jail. One of those projects that you said specifically, I would love to get you back and do it because I've never done a western on Bad for Your Health. Oh, great! And I think you know which one I were talking. We said it pregame. Yes. Oh, I would love to. Ta I would love because I share the character's last name. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's correct. That is. So, yeah, we'll just tantalize everybody with that. Ooh, what are they doing? Yeah. What are they talking about? Yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking are of they the talking next. Talking about whispering Smith. Are we talking about whispering Smith. I called my nephew today, Ohio Smith, jokingly, and that and that led into the joke of uh, the other state. Uh, Courtney, coming up though, I would love to have you back for uh, a seventh victim episode. Do a little. Oh, that would be great. I would love to do a little looting with you if you're in. Sure. No, talk about Mark Robeson and moving from you know editor to director and all of that stuff. Would you I'll do seventh victim? Where would you like to go? Seventh victim or cat people? You could pick. Oh, let's do seventh victim just because that's you know not it's as no long. Love. It's cat it people. gets no love. It gets no love. <laughs> seventh victim. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you a quick Lawrence Tierney Mark Robeson story. Please. Ro Robeson was directing Larry in some movie. I can't remember what it was. It might have been Step by Step. I honestly can't recall. And Mark Robeson would had kind of an odd habit. Sometimes with directing, he'd say, uh, Larry, can you give me 2% more? And so Larry thought it was kind of strange. So he does the take. He turns around to him and says, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that I think that was seven percent. That was seven <laughs> percent. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> you you told me a, a Larry story. 
that I I I remembered since you told me it. It was the John Agar story. Oh yeah, John Agar, he's a good guy. Which, by the way, uh, the time with him. <laughs> have you did you uh, did you pick up Burt Kern's biography? No, where where can I pick that up? Oh my God, it came out right before Christmas. It's a smash hit. It's where can I, I? I mean, I'm in it quite a bit. Now a lot of other people are too. It's called uh, Lawrence Tierney, uh, Hollywood's uh, tough guy. I've heard of it. Now I'm going to get it. It's he did a fantastic job. Really, this, really great. This stuff keeps us out of jail, man. It keeps us. It keeps yeah. us honest reading this stuff. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And the centerpiece photograph is me strangling Larry on the top of a pool table at the Hollywood Athletic Club. That's an old. That's an old picture of you, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's an old picture of us both. He's been dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Courtney? I, that's on your Facebook, if I recall that picture. It was, yeah. And I, was gonna, I was actually because we we do have each other's phone numbers, and I was going to. Uh, well, I have yours, but we were going to. I was going to have that as your contact. Oh, no. oh sure. <laughs> was you choking a guy on a pool table? Yep. <laughs> What's the backstory behind that photo, Courtney? We were no. I was. We were with my friend Tom Mecklem and. Uh, you know, we were just spending an afternoon with the old guy and walking around and he was telling us stories about being in the Hollywood Athletic Club. And Larry said something to me. I can't remember what it was. It was very <laughs> funny. And he goes, you know, I know I drive you crazy. And I said, Larry, I only think about killing you like two or three times a day. <laughs> well, here's your chance. And he threw himself back. And so we did. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> but yeah, this is the photo of you. There's a photo of you I, I, I saw on your Facebook when we met. And I, I don't want to say I cre cre creeped on it or looked for it, but I looked for it again. But it was you like in Western gear sitting like this, like looking at something. Oh, that was the author's picture that Steve Carver took of me to uh, go on the inside front of the uh, jacket of the book that we wrote together. That's a good freaking picture. <laughs> Steve was a wonderful photographer. He yeah, was, God rest his soul. He was uh, that, but that picture of you is a great, oh, great you. picture. Because yeah. you legit yeah. look like one of those guys in the, you know, like in the saloon. Oh, yeah, he built, he built a set for me and everything, and you know, I got into costume, the whole deal. That's awesome. Uh, any future appearance on the Spaghetti Western podcast coming up for you? Anything going on no, with that? I don't, I don't think so. I mean. I'm popping up on, you know, these uh, commentaries, but uh, no, nope. I love Tom. I mean, maybe he'll send up a flare. God bless Tom Betts' show. Love it. Uh, and this Professor Lampini's podcast, The Horrors, you and Jay yeah, Jennings and talking. Yeah, about and the new one with Jeff Yeager is great. That can't wait. I'll be watching that tonight. And as always, yeah, Courtney, you are all you are always welcome on Bad for Your Health. Whenever you want to plug something obscure, random, whatnot. You know where I am. Oh, well, thank you, my friend. This was great. And again, congratulations on your upcoming nuptials. Thank you. Uh, no date set yet, even though it kind of is. So there'll be more on that as the uh, as 2023 progresses. Courtney, when can we shoot for uh, Seventh Victim? When's What's a good time for Just, you? You know, uh, send up a flare. And I know you have some other folks who are going to be involved. And just let me know what's convenient for everybody. Seventh Victim, I was actually going to try to set up as a, like, quote unquote special where it was going to be like a lot of us okay just to okay. give attention to something that didn't normally get attention and i ran the idea by an individual and i don't think i've ever heard no said that quickly <laughs> and i was like did i upset you with tom conway and gene and gene brooks i'm like sorry <laughs> i was like I didn't know you hated Kim Hunter and Hugh Beaumont that much. And uh, yeah. the other guy there, the one that died in the war. So hey, well, I'm, I'm giving you an emphatic yes. Seventh victim it is. February probably. I'll send you a flare soon. Okay. Good deal. Uh, what else? Uh, tune in next week, everyone, for a brand new episode of Bad for Health Entertainment. Don't forget to check out Still Dead Illustrations. Don't forget to check out Courtney Joyner's new projects. Everything from the Westerns. Oh, God. What are you uh, just to rehash some of them, Courtney? You, you've got commentation for Indicator, Red a for Arrow, Shout, Scream, Film Detective. Hope to see more Film Detective content coming out soon. 
you know, yeah, before, me too. before we go, they, because of the Sherlock Holmes debacle in, you remember that whole, like they didn't send the movies and all that. So they gave everyone the streaming service for a year. Yes. I still got it. It's over a year. <laughs> Very good. Not complaining. Not complaining because they're the only streaming channel that has three on a ticket. <laughs> For Mr. Courtney Joyner, I am Tom. Have a good week, everyone, and we'll see you next week. As I said, don't forget to check out Still Dead Illustrations and Professor Lampini's podcast of horrors and Spaghetti Western podcast. I help. Hey. I feel like promoting people. Good night, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.